So, well, hello everybody, and this is the first of the uh, virtual concourse roundtable chats. And as you all know, the first class up is preservation class, so that's what we're talking about today. Um, delighted you could join us. Hope you enjoy the chat. Uh, but you'll see when I introduce the three people you see on the screen before you um, that we've got some of the top people in their game here. So I think we're going to have a, an interesting chat. So first of all, Massimo. Massimo Delbo has always been a car lover. And in 1997, he started working for an Italian car magazine and he hasn't stopped since. He considers his Otto Fraschini the most important and forgotten brand in automotive history. And he's driven its very first and very last cars built, which is a conversation for another time, I think. He is the Italian contributor for Octane magazine, a freelance classic car writer, a communication consultant for Lamborghini Polo Storico and an, an experienced concourse judge. And in his garage is a small collection of classics, but he says the tanks are always filled up because for Massimo, cars are meant to be driven. So Massimo, thank you very much for joining us. Good to have you here. Uh, now, Mikhail Haggerty, that's a face that a few people will know, is CEO and the driving force behind Haggerty, behind Haggerty, the world's largest membership insurance and media organization for enthusiast vehicle owners. Mikhail has been a judge for Pebble Beach since 1999, and in an effort to preserve historic vehicles and related artifacts as a lasting record, McKeel created the Historic Vehicle Association, the HVA, in 2009, leading to the development of the National Historic Vehicle Register. Um, McKeel was presented with the Nicola Bulgari Award for America's Car Magazine, for America's Car uh, Museum, sorry, in 2014 for his contributions to preserving cars through education, restoration, and collecting. McKeel, you're very welcome. <clears throat> And last and certainly not least, uh, Sandra Button. Welcome, Sandra. Sandra became chairman of the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance in 2002, having been its executive director for many years before that. Sandra has been instrumental in the development of the global concourse movement, and she and her husband, Martin Button, have acquired and preserved or restored an eclectic collection of automobiles, ranging from a 1904 Oldsmobile to a 1972 okay. Ferrari 365 GTC4. And not to mention, importantly, couple of Bentleys and they're regularly participating in driving events such as the Thousand Mila Sports Argentina, the Copper State 1000 and the London to Brighton Veteran Car Run. So Sandra you're welcome, all of you are. So let's chat about this preservation class. Now Mikhail I'll probably come to you first if I may. Now you regularly judge preservation classes at major concourse, a real concourse that is where you can actually touch and see and feel them. What is it that appeals to you particularly about the preservation class? Well, at first, you know, I think you mentioned I've been doing it for 20 something years when back when Jay Human first came up kind of with the idea that we need to bring forward these wonderfully preserved cars and, and put them on maybe not the center stage, but we need to bring them onto the stage and recognize that, you know, I love that restored cars are great and they can be wonderful, but that preserved cars present a different dimension. To, to, to the automotive world. Um, you know, and at first when you see, uh, you know, a bunch of preservation class cars next to a whole bunch of restored ones, they look kind of dull and, and maybe not quite as, as shiny and, and perfect as the rest of them. But that's where the best part of this begins. And, and, and I think that when you get into the judging of them or the scrutineering of them, uh, if you think about it from a FIVA standpoint, is that that's where the real stories come out about these cars, I think in, in, in almost more unique ways. And, and to me, it's not about the, it's, it's not that the car is, it's not that it's the best preserved car, it's the car best preserved. And it, yeah. and it shows this love of conserving the thing. Very often there's wonderful stories about, uh, you know, people just, just bringing them forward and carefully maintaining them and, and not having them, um, you know, be restored. Uh, and it's just, it's a different dimension of the passion. And I think that in a way that the history of the car comes even more alive than when you just see this static, perfect example, and then people are telling what happened to it at some point during its life. So to me, it's as much about the people as the car. And I think it's the preservation world brings you kind of this best and unique combination of great cars and, and really great people. And it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily always the case, but often a preserved car has been in, in single ownership for a long time, often family ownership, because that's why it's been preserved. So do you find that this makes the backstory more interesting because it's often long-term ownership by the same family? 
Exactly. You know, and it's, it, it can be a multi-generational thing. And, and I remember there have been, you know, as we have in our class this year, you, you get some cars that were sort of stored away and they sat forever and then they kind of reappeared. But it is that multi-generational family ownership sometimes that makes it the most interesting, yeah. which was this, my grandfather's car, great-grandfather's car, and this is what they did for it. Or you know, I remember there was a Ferrari at Pebble Beach a few years ago where there was a guy who saw, he was a busboy in an Italian restaurant in New York, and he begged the owner of this car to sell it to him as, as like a busboy. Yeah. And he, him. And he's just, it's been his lifetime passion to preserve this car exactly as he remembered it as this, you know, 14 year old working in an Italian restaurant. And it just, it's so delightful um, that his kids have picked up the passion and now yeah. they're carrying it forward. So it's just, it's a wonderful part of the car world. It's not for everyone. It's okay. But I'm so glad it's, it's, you know, on the stage now. Well, it is. And, and Sandra, turning to you, I mean, you, we all, many people know, you introduced a preservation class into Pebble Beach. Um, why did you particularly do this at the time and, and what do you think it's brought to the event? Well, Jay Human, who was chairman prior to me, along with Lauren Tryon, he really listened to a lot of the owners who said, you know, I've got this great car, I don't want to touch it. And it's, it's a wonderful example of a preserved vehicle, but I can't bring it to Pebble Beach. And as early as 1972, when Jack Passy joined the group of judges at Pebble Beach, he advocated for preservation, even back then. Yeah. But it took, yeah, it took until the mid-90s, and we started inviting FIVA to come and uh, select vehicles from the entire field. We didn't, we didn't have a, you know, one class of preserved cars together. And that, that took until 99, um, when we finally put together uh, a class of... I guess it was 2001 was our very first pre-war preservation class. And to see all those cars together, you know, eight or 10, uh, telling the story of what the cars could be if they were left alone and taken care of, not ignored, but taken care of. And I, I mean, I, like, like all of us on this screen, probably when I come to Pebble Beach each year, the first thing I do is walk around looking at the preservation cars. But what was the reaction positive? You've got a lot of people who come every year to Pebble Beach, especially in those earlier days. What was the reaction? Did people find it strange or did they embrace it? Well, I think it was a combination because early on we were getting, you know, some cars end up preserved because nobody wanted to use them. And, you know, that we had to be careful with the cars we brought on the field, that they were dynamic, yeah. that they were also a car that someone would would want to restore if that was the right road for that car. Um, so initially there was some back and forth and then as the cars started to come out of the woodwork, out of garages all over the world, and better and better examples were there, we even had judges in a, in a regular class go over to the preserved car when they had a question and they used it as a reference. Yeah. See if the restoration was done properly. That's fantastic. I mean, I have, when I was, a, I used to work at Bentley Motors, as you know, and, and we had challenges with our cars that we owned in the collection. And often it's easier just to take a piece off and throw it away. And it's much more difficult to, to actually rework it, you know, conserve it and keep it on the car. I mean, Massimo, one for you. I mean, often a conservation, in my experience, costs more than a restoration. So, you know, uh, you, you advise Paul Historico, amongst others, but how can restorers encourage owners to, take the time and trouble and to invest in conservation. You are absolutely right, Richard. It's for sure that uh, preservation costs more than uh, restoration because it's definitely more time consuming. It's more difficult uh, um, to work on a car with the aim of protecting uh, every single uh, uh, problem that the car has and just fixing it in the way that it still keep uh, is originality then to really work up and remail practically brand, a car brand new. Let's say that probably one of the most important uh, um, idea that you can give to a customer is the residual value. You know, um, another store and car more and more every day is more important, is more rare, and thus became more valuable with time. If you take, uh, if you look at classic cars, you can say that you have uh, two piles. From one side, you have the original car, and from the other side, you have the restored cars. 
and uh, this is a finished number. So when uh, you take a car from the uh, heel of the original car and you restore it, this car is moved away from this uh, group uh, forever. You cannot bring it back. No. And so, and every day we are making the, the one of preser the, the preserved cars less and less and less. At the very end, what we will have will be that very few will remain. And these are very important as a reference because, you know, when you restore a car, you need a reference. And we know that when you restore a car, doesn't matter how good you are in your restoration, you lose a little bit of originality. So at the very end, to keep a car original, guarantee you the fact that uh, you have something that is more and more unique. And this is uh, giving you back, let's say the long-term investment, you know, you, you put more money, you put more effort, um, uh, work on what you're doing now, but in the long term, the fact that you kept the car original will give you back uh, everything you invested in it, both in the satisfaction, both in time, and both, of course, even in money too. Well, there is, thank you. There is the practical issue as well of usability, and we'll come back to that because people buy car unless you are one of the fortunate few and we see them at pebble beach sandra who who have many cars therefore they can have other cars that they will drive more than a car that's preserved um but but mckeel coming back to you i mean you, you run an insurance business is there are there particular challenges that preserve preservation vehicles cause or not from an insurance perspective well they really do although the you know the car market hasn't quite figured out how to deal with some of these. You know, sometimes when a car is a preserved car or, you know, or they, they aren't sort of viewed as a premium example of the vehicle. And then, then you'll see an auction or you'll see a private sale where something that, you know, came out of a barn somewhere or was well preserved and it really sells at a great premium because it's just so exceptionally rare. Um, and so we're not, we don't have an even, treatment of which ones are kind of more valuable because they're preserved versus just as Sandra described, maybe in need of a restoration because sometimes they are. Sometimes just barn find cars need to be restored. They're, they're really not that useful as a, as a preserved example. The challenge you have um, is that a really well preserved car that's in very good shape, if it were to have an accident, you now face a real dilemma because you pretty much have to restore the car. So uh, I have a, for example, I have a couple of preserved cars. One is a 60, 66 uh, E-Type Jaguar yeah. that has 13,000 original miles. It is just a time capsule. It's lovely, but increasingly I'm, I'm scared to death to drive it. You know, I mean, E-Types are so low. And of course you're looking right about at the hubs of the SUV, uh, you know, next to you in traffic. And I'm always worried that somebody's gonna run into me and I'm gonna to have to restore this car. Um, so I think that the challenge that you run into is it's, you know, kind of for the exact reason that Massimo described, you know, once you restore a car, it can never be exactly original again. You lose a little bit of that originality, but preserved ones become so precious that they, I think they, they tend to be used a lot less and they're, they're much more difficult to repair if they have some sort of accident. So it's a challenge. It, it really it is, is a challenge. Well, we look at a form and it talks about, replacement value well hang on a minute if this is, this is a an un, unrestored car well that's almost immaterial but sandra coming to the point about usability um how do you balance the 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 uh, the, the, the dichotomy the pressures between preserving a car in its original state where as as mckeel said you really can't use it versus you know some degree of restoration even though taking most of point once you've started it it's no longer the original car but it's it's a real it's a real problem for people to decide. Well, it's been a question that's come up often in judging at Pebble Beach in a preservation class where someone is actually using their car and they maybe have done some work on the mechanicals because it is a car. And so whether they want to use that car and they need an electric fan, uh, they need a heat shield, uh, you know, driving conditions are so different than they were, especially for pre-war cars. So the question comes up in, in many times and it comes to a, a boiling point at a judging where, you know, are, are these changes okay to a preserved car? Because after all, it is a car and it should drive and it should be out on the road or should have the ability to be out on the road, whether it's used that much or not. 
Yeah, this, I mean, this is a question I was going to ask is that, uh, and again, I have some personal experience of this at Bentley, but, but you, there are some things you can add to a, a, a very original car, an unrestored car, that make it safer or more usable uh, or more practical on the road, that literally you can put it on and you can take it off. You know, whether that's uh, an electric fan or whether it's a different a, a fuel pump or, a, or an alternator, there are things that you can put on which you can take off again. So you would imagine that generally speaking at a, at a concourse, as long as you've taken those bits off when you've come on the field, when it's judged in the, in the um, modern bits removed state, should that be acceptable, even though the judges will know that as soon as it's been judged, those bits are going back on again? Well, I think it's absolutely acceptable and it should be the way of the future. Because if these cars are gonna be around 100 years from now and somehow not be a, a Chippendale chair with a ribbon across it that you can't sit in, yeah. I mean, that, that would, that's the worst thing that could happen to the hobby. I mean, th these are cars. Let's have them out doing what they're supposed to do. Well, Massimo, you, you, would, you would enjoy that. I mean, there are the situations, I'm sure you've come across it, where people will, never mind adding a fan or a fuel pump, people will have a, a replica engine. So they can keep the original engine on the bench, put another engine in to drive the car, maybe even to rally it or race it. Um, a Goodwood Revival or something, and then when it goes back to the collection to be viewed, the, the original engine goes back in. But I would say that uh, I will uh, keep separate uh, racing cars with normal cars, because um, um, I totally agree on the fact that uh, cars are meant to be driven, so every possible way to keep them on the road, uh, even if our uh, original and our restored car is correct. But on the other side, when you go racing, if you start to put together the fact that if you are serious in racing, you are taking serious risk. Second, you are putting a lot of strain in the car. And then you start to, um, to race and you're willing to go faster, meaning that you put the bigger modern tires. They have a different compound, so they put a, a different stress on the suspension. So you have to upgrade the suspension. Mm -hmm. And then you want more of power. So you enter in a loop where originality and racing cars are absolutely two opposite words. It's not possible to imagine a preserved car going racing in any sort of competitive way. Uh, on the other side, there are the cars that uh, you want to keep original and you want to drive. You know, we tend to um, overprotect them and we tend to forget that already in 1907, somebody drove from Peking to Paris with uh, a, a car and the car never had big issues linked with the car. Maybe got a lot of flat tires, broke a, broke a rim, but the car was running well. So now we have uh, better lubricants, we have better fuel. So we just have to protect them from the different environment. That means practically more traffic. So you need uh, help uh, for the cooling system, that for sure. Uh, but on the other side, uh, I am against when you, people start to put uh, uh, different ignition because the old system was not working. No, it's working. It's not working as well as a modern one. Yeah. It is working. So you will, you will not have the full of power all the time, but you will be able to run around happily for all the miles that you want to. Uh, and that to me makes a difference. But it's even true that uh, uh, as a part of AC JEG um, judging group, you know, what I can tell is the fact that we never deduct, for example, in the, our guideline is clearly written, for any uh, equipment that help the car to stay on the road. So uh, that is uh, logic. Of course, if you come with a 40 with disc brakes because brakes better, is not something that uh, we will accept. But in the same time, if you come with a car that was not equipped with uh, um, a fan for the radiator and you add an external fan, I don't see the problem. Maybe don't put uh, a fluo orange one, you just spray it in black and to hide it a little bit. But I don't see, but I don't see uh, main issue on this. And that was honestly up to the 60s, 50s, 60s, but then cars were absolutely already able of coping with today condition, today traffic. A different point, completely different, is the note that McKeel did before. So it's uh, safe for you and for the car uh, to be in, um, in modern traffic uh, because uh, sometimes uh, uh, the person in front of us do not realize uh, 
that it has a four uh, ventilated disc with ABS and we have uh, four drums that more or less are working. And if you jump on his brake after passing us, uh, we are in trouble. Uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, another point. Uh, but we know that more and more we have rallies and we have opportunities where you can go and driving and having fun in good condition for you and for the car. Um, of course, when you have a completely original car, you have to be more careful even in using it. You know, when they were the Daytona, the, the, the Cobra Daytona classes in, um, in Goodwood, we had five restored cars and one unrestored car. And of course, the five restored were definitely faster. The unrestored was lower, but uh, all the loves and all the eyes were for the unrestored. Sure, sure. I mean, Mikhail, you get going to pick up on that. I mean, there's race cars that are race cars, and then there are, especially pre-wars, a lot of pre-war cars that effectively were road cars that were raced. Um, and I'm sure that we've all done it where we judge cars, and cars do evolve over time. So it's, it's, that, it's that subtle difference between complete originality and evolution of a car. So as Massimo said, you know, when you race a car, bits get dented, bits get broken, bits fail, you take them off and you replace them. You replace them. But that part might have been replaced in period. So I think we have to look at a race car or a car that has been raced differently because it will have evolved over time. Well, that's exactly right. And we'd also expect that any car, whether it's a race car or road car that was used regularly during its life, so, I mean, there were a lot of parts on those cars that were thought of to be consumable uh, during the use of the car. Belts, hoses, tires, even the exhaust system. So you would expect to see parts replaced, you know, hopefully, ideally, just for the fun of it in period, you know, rather than looking underneath the car and seeing a brand new stainless steel exhaust system on a nicely yeah. uh, preserved car, which happens now and then, you know, you get down on the, your knee and look up underneath this thing and you're blinded by a stainless exhaust system. Um, but I'm also not a big fan of false patina. You know, if you go too far into trying to fake new parts to look like old parts, then it feels like somebody's playing a game. Um, and I'd, I'd rather they just be really honest um, about it. You know, Jay Leno has a Model A Duesenberg, um, not a J, but an A, that he, it's a preserved car, but the, the, the engine was not usable. So they made a very conscious decision to essentially restore the engine and put it back into the preserved car. And yes, when you open it up, you get this big, bright look in your face, but I think it's also a good decision. They made the only decision. If that car was ever to run again, it, the engine needed to be completely restored. And I think it, you know, it's a, you get a little bit of a mishmash of new and old, but I think the spirit of preservation remained the same. So it's a, I, I, I like, you know, the signs of active preservation during the course of its life. And then you get other weird cars, you know, you as a, somebody who knows Bentley very well, you know, Miles Collier's Eddie Hall Bentley. I mean, that car went through 17 years of changes while it was actively racing by Bentley, by Bentley themselves. And so, it, I mean, it's really kind of an amalgamation of almost two decades of work by the factory. Um, so, you know, it's not the prettiest car, but it's really a great story. That's, that's a good example. That, that's a car that's not original, but, um, right. but it is very important for lots of other reasons. It, you know, so cars can be important. Uh, for lots of reasons uh, and you know going back to Sandra every year we see at Pebble Beach an astonishing array of cars and we're always amazed that you manage to find such great cars every year and I think now what the, the, the pressure that's on restorers now that conservation is seen to be so important and preservation is seen to be so important that they're, I think both the restorer and the owner will try so much harder to only change that that needs to be changed and I'm sure that the leaving aside the preservation car, class Sandra the whole field benefits from that attitude because it means that restored cars are better restored than they were. Well, I think that the movement to gently restore, you know, and keep as much authenticity to the car is so important. And as we hand these cars over and, and we're not here anymore, the, the transparency of what happened to that car, how that's documented, what needed to be done and why, you, you hand that to the next generation and, and on and on. And I think that's really important that we combine, you know, some cars need to be restored, but it should be done gently and, and with an eye to keeping it what it was supposed to be when it left the factory or, or the coach builder. 
yeah. and not changing it into something else and being very, very transparent about every step that you took. Yeah, exactly. Honesty in this is very important. And it's, it's where you try and pretend something that isn't what it painfully is that you fall over. As you say, a good, honest restoration if it's necessary, nothing wrong with that at all. But equally, they can sit alongside a preservation class and both have their own attractions. I mean, we, we're, we're going to look forward to judging over the next few days the preservation class in the concourse virtual. Uh, Mikhail, since you're cleverer than me, maybe we could pull up some of the cars that we're going to be judging over the next few days. I mean, I've been through the list. And when we look at the range of cars we've got from right from an 1893 Salveson steamer, you know, all the way up to, um, well, through uh, Austin 7s, Aston Martin Ulsters, a number of Cricklewood Bentleys I'm delighted to see, Lagonda, Hansa, Stutz, and then some cars which are the, one of a kind, like the Leach or, or uh, there's that 1913 Scat, you know, it's some interesting, a, a range of astonishing preservation cars we've got to look at. We've got this fantastic 1908 Fiat. Yes. So here's a great you know, I mean, this one's pretty epic, right? Can you see that well on the, on the screen? I can see it perfectly. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, you know, this is a truly spectacular car. This is this would be one, right, that we're going to have to think very carefully about the story. Um, you know, this car, you know, when you think about it, it's undeniable. It's It has all of the you know, all, all of the cred of being a very old, well-preserved car, but it did sit for a long time, right? A lot and of work. It's, it's a race car as well. Yes, of course, exactly to that point that we were talking about earlier. Now, if you go to the, what, what else would you like to see? And I'll, I'll just follow along. I, I would love the three liter Bentley, the 1927. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, we, I always say that when we are looking at a classic car, we are looking at the story of the car, but we are celebrating the story of the men and of the women behind it. And I think that with some car, you still have more evident uh, how this uh, very car impact in the life of somebody. And that's why it's been uh, so well preserved during uh, its lifetime. So they really became parts of the family in a certain way. And so we're, we're really taking care, but they were never put under the restoration because they would have lost their soul, there was no need for it. So that is my opinion, is very, very important. Still more when you judge uh, a preserved car to see what is what has been the, the history. Because, you know, we see that some unrestored car that we have the opportunity of seeing around have 1,000 miles from new. And that is wonderful, that is amazing. And those cars will deserve uh, uh, an exception, meaning those cars shouldn't be driven. Those cars should, became, should be closed in the museum and being protected as a reference for everybody else doing restoration. But on the other side, you have an unrestored car that has been driven around with families for journeys, holidays, day-to-day uh, -day driving a child, children to school. And that's magic to me. And the fact that they leave their duty, they make their duty, they live their life uh, being driven. And, they survive then, they're in good condition. I think okay. it's absolutely fantastic. It is, of course, as you say, that's a car with a huge history, but, but then it's an interesting one to judge because when you look at it, it's, it's looking amazingly shiny for an unrestored car. And, uh, um, you know, it is, I mean, I know, I, know, I know the car and I know that it is an extremely original car, but, but if you compare that, uh, Mikhail, if you could go to something like the Leech or the, um, uh, where are we, the, uh, yeah, take a look at that. Um, you know, this is a car that's a very honest car. It's not exciting. It's not, um, it's not you know, the sort of car that's going to draw a big crowd necessarily at a, at a concourse, but it's a lovely, honest car that looks to me as though it's had very little of anything done over the years. Well, and we get to use that phrase that we only get to use now and then, which is, of all the leeches you've ever seen, this is one of the best, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is. It'll win the leech class every year, this, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> it will have a dedicated class in Pebble Beach. <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh, The Peterson has one, I believe. As I, I think they had a 27 leech. Yeah. The first one I had ever seen. So this is exactly the second one I have ever seen in my life. Well, there you go. Uh, I, mean, but I, so I think that's right. I, I think, you know, from a pure preservation standpoint, you'd have to look pretty seriously. The 27 Bentley has such a wonderful story. 
but it looks like a restored car to me. That would be my first reaction yeah. to it. Um, what else would you like to see? Well, what about the stats? A -A? Yeah, this is the car on the left, isn't it? I mean, it looks astonishingly um, untouched, this car. Yes, I, you look at that. Wow. But this, we've, we've, we're fortunate in this class, we've got three or four cars in, in this sort of condition, which, you know, does shout preservation, does shout original, um, perhaps more than some. And, you know, it's going to be a tough call because, you know, as somebody said earlier, these aren't necessarily always the most attractive car on the field, but, the, but they have an appeal about them that uh, is unmistakable. Look at that. History. Absolute history there. Yeah. So and you know, it's even difficult to judge a car uh, through pictures because we all know that uh, you know the light uh, or the the way the car uh, was under the camera make a difference. So it's it's not easy to understand to the details. Here you just really have to f to more to follow your feeling uh, and trying to imagine because it's really difficult to see uh, the real condition or the real. Uh, a uh, feeling of a car uh, from a picture. No, you're right. From, you're right. Uh, uh, that's the challenge we will have to take up. Now, Sandra, this this was this was a Pebble Beach. This car. This, I mean, it looks. It's astonishingly beautiful. Uh, it's Bob, it looks astonishingly beautiful. This car. I mean, uh, do you remember this car being at PB? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's unusual to see something like a Duesenberg that hasn't been touched. Yeah. Um. This this one even has the. I guess the gentleman had a tiger that he would ride around and it even has claw marks on the seats from the tiger. <laughs> so it's got quite the story, if you can imagine. But you know, it's much more likely to see a leech or something like a leech unrestored and untouched. But very, very seldom do you see something like this Duesenberg left the way it is. Uh, what a find. Oh, absolutely. And it's great that it went into, a, into an ownership where it's gonna be kept that way. What, Mikhail, one more. Let's have a look at uh, one of the old, oldest. This is a tough one to judge. The 1893. Look at this. So this is just. What about this? This is real time warp stuff. And you, you recognize the owner. Do you guys know the owner? Met him a few times. Yeah, he's because he has the. Uh, oh, what's the? He's got a, another big Fiat that was at. Uh, the London Concourse and at Hampton Court because it won the London Concourse. Um, the Beast of Turin is his as well. Yeah. The 72, the 72. Yeah, which is just a monster. But this, this yeah. is obviously his, he just loves these, these ancient relics and uh, you know, he, he uh, campaigns them enthusiastically, which is what we want to see. But look at that. You couldn't, you couldn't pop down on Sunday morning and just throw your bag in that and drive off, could you? <laughs> Not very quickly, at least. No. Uh, <laughs> and you wouldn't I think you might the neighbors might know you were leaving as well if you start this up well yeah, that's right well you know it, it's like but when you go into the london of brighton and you see you know in particular so many of these veteran cars you know 1904 or older still working you know each of them in their with their cantankerous and and you know really uh different approaches to try to make early mobility work you know early automobiles work and Yet you'll see young people driving them. You'll see grandparents and, you know, granddaughters driving the car, you know, for its 70th London to Brighton run. It just gives you heart that the car world endures and uh, it can carry forward for a long time, even with a car that may not look super exciting. So that's so. brilliant. Well, come off the share. Let's just have a look at each other again before I wrap this up in a minute, Mikhail, but just uh, take that down. Well, Thank you, that's fascinating. But it shows we have a real challenge when it comes to judging this class. We've got a few days to do it. We're gonna have a look at it, look at the entr entrance, have a chat about it next week. We can go back to some of the owners and ask for some more information. But what a challenge, but a fun challenge it's gonna be. But listen it's guys, I wanna say a big thank you to all of you for joining. Um, I'm gonna press the stop record button in a minute and then we can just wrap up. But thanks a lot, and I hope that uh, those of you. Thanks, thanks to our thanks to our hairy leader. <laughs> yeah, the, this is what happens when you put an amateur in charge of technology. But so far, so good. <laughs>